towards a more biblical cosmology. <clears throat> That's what I want to talk about. I had two previous cosmologies, but they didn't take enough account of what God said he did in the first four days of creation. So the one I'm working on now, and have been working on for a few years, just sort of kind of letting it uh, simmer on the back of the stove, uh, uh, tries to take uh, account of all the scripture that I know of that uh, would deal with this. So let's take a, first, a look at the very beginning of the first day of creation. Uh, do you see uh, anything? Let's see. Wow. No, you don't see anything. Well, that was what was there at the very beginning. Uh, so first only blackness and nothingness. Then, in the beginning, God created. And you know what he created? The heavens and the earth. And uh, I think uh, the heavens is just the word, the biblical word for space. Sometimes it can include uh, uh, the heavenly host, but it doesn't have to. Uh, so when did he do this? Well, uh, all of us believe uh, we take the scripture straightforwardly about 6,000 years ago, give or take 200. Uh, and according to science, we have some evidence that says it's pretty close to 6,000 plus or minus 2,000. That's a project I work on involving helium and, and minerals and how fast it leaks for minerals. So the next verse, the earth was formless and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That's the second verse of Genesis 1. Now, uh, notice those words, the deep and the waters. Now, uh, the word deep, uh, as best I can tell from a bunch of lexicons, the most general meaning of it, the word is to home, the most general meaning is just a large body of water. It can mean an ocean. It can refer to underground aquifers, underground water. Uh, so that's all it means. And then you get a clue, furthermore, uh, that at the last part of the verse, that it's waters. So we can picture what the deep looked like. I'm thinking it was a big ball of water. So the deep, I think, I'm going to show verses later that suggest that it was a big ball of water, much bigger than the earth. Uh, and I deduce uh, ball from the, the fact that the Spirit of God was hovering over or above or upon the face of the waters. And that kind of implies an up and a down, which implies gravity. And if you have a big ball of, big blob of water, uh, gravity, its own gravity is going to pull it into a spherical shape. So a big ball of water. Ordinary liquid water, by the way. And that's just because Hebrew has a lot of nice words for other possibilities like ice or uh, vapor, water vapor, or some want to make it... Uh, incandescent plasma, a big ball of plasma, but the better Hebrew word for that would be some of the words for fire. So, so I just take it straightforwardly as plain, ordinary, liquid water. Now, all is darkness. Now, darkness was on the face of the deep. But, oh, oh by the way, I forgot to say, uh, the earth was formless and void within the deep. Uh, it could have been a loose collection of atoms just dissolved in the water near, near as it will turn out, near the center. Uh, or it could just be an undefined region of pure water uh, at, near the center. But uh, that doesn't really matter to me. So uh, now all is darkness, but God 
lights up the face of the deep. And so here's what happened. God said, let there be light, and there was light. So first the light shone from all directions on the big ball of water. And God saw that the light was good. And uh, then uh, the next thing is, the next part of that verse, God separated the light from the darkness. So he made the light shine from one direction, I think is what he meant. So uh, now, important thing to note is that the sun is not the source of the light. God didn't make the sun until the fourth day of creation. So uh, there's a hint as to the source. It's in Psalm 104, verse 2, uh, where he speaks of God covering himself with light as with a cloak. And it's in this uh, section of the psalm that is referring to the first day of creation, or it seems to be. Next, an expanse appeared at the center. God said, let there be an expanse or a firmament at the, in the midst of the waters. Now, that word for expanse is a very interesting one. It's, uh, it's not the usual word you would expect in this account. I, I wouldn't, you know, it's, and it's produced arguments uh, among the scholars for over 2,000 years about this. There, there's been, you know, just exactly what does he mean by this particular word. It's kind of an odd word, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, the word is rakia in the Hebrew, and the Septuagint Greek translation of it is stereoma, and the Greek are, was translated into Latin later on uh, with the word firmamentum. See those words up there? See if this works. Firmamentum. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, the King James translators uh, took the Latin translation and made a new word, I think. I'm not sure it existed before uh, their translation, and they called it the firmament. The rakia seems to mean something spread out by hammering it thin, something solid, actually. Uh, and you get that in several other uh, sections of Scripture. Uh, here's a goldsmith hammering out some gold, uh, spreading it out, and you have uh, descriptions in Scripture of hammering out gold into thin sheets and doing things with it, and uh, hammering out uh, copper uh, instruments, hammering them out and uh, spreading them out on the uh, altar of incense. So something, something that is hammered or pushed flat in one of its dimensions and spreads out in all the other dimensions it has. Now the problem is that uh, uh, apparently there's another dimension involved here. And there are many hints to that in Scripture, and I've written them on that in uh, an article in the Journal of Creation. Uh, there's a lot of hints that the space in which we exist, the, our universe, uh, is uh, very thin in a fourth direction that we can't detect. And Scripture also uh, hints pretty strongly that our, what we regard as empty space is really some kind of stuff, a solid, but we can't perceive it. And in modern physics, uh, there's ways for, for that to happen. We can move through that solid without detecting it, and it can move through us. Uh, so I'll bend your ear about what modern physics has to say about that and experiment uh, as well as theory. So it's a solid that's pounded thin in its fourth dimension that we can't see. So we're all very thin in that dimension. Uh, if any of you were worried about your weight, you're at least thin in one dimension. So uh, that, that, I think, is the factor 
that most of the scholars weren't taking into account over those last two millennia. Uh, and so uh, instead, uh, skeptics wanted to make it a thin uh, three-dimensional piece of plating across the sky, uh, very thin, hammered thin in that in one of its dimensions, but spread out in its other two dimensions. So you get the distinction. If you add another distinction, then it's spread out in three dimensions. So that, I think, is what's in the word. So uh, now there's another very interesting word in that same verse. Midst, in the midst of the waters. Well, let's see. That word is batok, uh, and it just seems to mean in the general middle of something. Like Eve talked about the tree, we shall not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. And uh, she was apparently specifying a pretty definite location, so it probably was the center of the garden, the tree of life. Uh, God talked about the tree of life in the midst of the garden. And so anyhow, in the midst, let's see what was in the midst of the waters then. I'm going to show you a picture. Uh, the firmament or the expanse or the rakia started in the midst of the water. So you see that uh, this little space right here, I think it was very thin to begin with in, in the, uh, the outward direction, uh, and uh, it talks about the waters above the firmament and the waters below the firmament, and later on, those waters below the firmament on the third day became the solid earth that we now have. And maybe it became before that, but it emerged on the third day so the waters below the firmament are earth-sized. And so uh, this thing here is 6,000 kilometers. And uh, so the firmament, uh, therefore, the, the waters above the firmament have to be a, a whole lot larger than the earth. Do you see that? So this is something that a lot of people don't get. So we have the face of the deep and something much greater than 6,000 kilometers in radius. So I'm going to leave it indefinite at that uh, for, well, no, I won't leave it indefinite. I think it was out there at about one or two light years in radius, halfway to the nearest star. Uh, and I have a reason for suggesting that. Uh, it has to do with the amount of waters that were above the firmament. But the firmament did not stay this small size. The firmament expanded greatly. So it was big enough for stars. And uh, God called the firmament heavens. And uh, so the, all, it, it expanded by the fourth day when God made the stars. It was big enough so that the waters were above the heavens. Uh, those waters were above all the stars. So, uh, and then you notice this motion here, this expansion of the firmament is what I think God is referring to uh, in many verses where, like this one, where God who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. That's Genesis 1.6. I'm sorry, that can't be Genesis 1.6. I think I just copied that verse number down there and I forgot to write the proper verse over it. It's in Isaiah chapter 40, uh, the latter part of the chapter. So... And there's seven, uh, 16 other verses like this throughout the Old Testament. Uh, I have a list of them in my book, Starlight and Time, in uh, Appendix B. So uh, you can look those up just for your own entertainment. But uh, 
to remind you, uh, a light year is a distance, like Danny was saying in his last talk, and it happens to be about six trillion miles. Now, uh, the waters are above the highest stars. The highest stars we can now see are, oh, say, between 10 and 12 billion light years. Uh, and so it has to be bigger than that. So uh, it's out there at, let's say, 14 billion light years or more, could be more, 100 billion light years. So uh, those waters above really got out there fast. Now, there's a psalm that helps us with this. Psalm 148, verse 4, confirms this picture, that the waters are above the highest stars. Praise him highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. So those waters that were above the rakia, above the firmament, are out there, and God called the firmament heavens. So uh, uh, they're way out there. And I think a lot of the water out there is ice, but some of it could be big planets uh, covered by ice but are full of water, uh, or bigger, even bigger things. So, but here's the diameter, greater than 24 billion light years. So, uh, have any of you ever seen that before in Scripture? Okay, we're in new territory. So, uh, now this psalm was written after the Genesis flood. So, it can't be talking about that canopy of water vapors that Henry Morris had in his theory. Uh, these waters would not have time to drop down and, and reach the earth way too far out. And in fact, there wouldn't be much gravity out there either. Uh, so, now, let's graph the action uh, on this. The firmament expanded very fast. Now, I'm going to uh, drag you through a graph. This vertical axis is time in Earth days. Zero, that would be creation. One, two, three, four, the fourth day. Five, day five. And this is distance on an extremely compressed scale. Uh, those of you who are techies uh, will recognize that as a logarithmic scale. But what it means is it's really compressed. So uh, here is, let's say, one light year, and that's the face of the deep. And then out here is one million light years and 10 billion light years. And uh, I'm just going to compress that into a, a short scale. So these are the waters... Uh, below the firmament. So down here, this line is that 6,000 kilometer line. So that's the boundary. Uh, when he made the rakia, he separated, made a separation, and you're going to see the deep moving out uh, as I press the animation. So let's do that. So the firmament expanded very fast. So uh, now let me back up here. The firmament uh, expanded out very fast. So it did that within, uh, let's say, from day one to day four, and then it just stayed out there, or moved out more slowly, let's say. Uh, and uh, so on day four is when the action, most of the action was done. So one to four, that's three days. Uh, and in three days, it moved out from uh, the surface from one light year out to 10 billion light years. So that means that those waters and the top of the expanse moved out trillions of times faster than light speed on Earth. Uh, that's, it's going to turn out to be a two-way speed of light, for those of you who are interested in that question about the one-way and two-way speed of light. This is, this is waters moving outward, 
and later on, light is going to move inward very fast in just a moment. So, now why would God do it this way? You know, uh, why not just start with the waters way out there just to, to begin with? You know, why, why bother, you know, moving, creating them small and then moving them way out? Uh, so, the theory of this that I have is that balls of water stayed behind and God converted them to the sun, moon, and stars uh, on the fourth day of creation. So if any of you were at Danny's seminar, uh, just the previous one, he was talking about God making the stars rather than creating them, making them from previously formed materials. I like this theory. Uh, I like that idea. Uh, so on the fourth day, the balls became stars and planets. Now, why do I like it? Well, if you were at my seminar last night, uh, it's because you can get a nice theory about how God created the magnetic fields, not only of the earth, but of the stars. So, uh, and the planets, and the moon, and the sun. So, that's makes it real simple. He just moved the waters out, but he uh, left water behind as it moved out. So now this outward motion of the firmament or the rakia or the expanse would cause red shifts, the famous red shift versus distance law that uh, you have to explain if you're going to have any attempt at a cosmology. So, uh, so now, oh, and by the way, to have enough water to make all the stars and bodies in the universe that we can detect, uh, you would have to have those water, the face of the waters back, the face of the deep back on day uh, one, be several light years at the, at the top, uh, several light years from the center. So that gives you enough water enough mass of water to make all the stars. So that's why I picked that one to two light years in radius. So, okay. Now, let's get back to the light from the stars. The light from the stars was fast. So I'm going to uh, give you that same plot a little closer up. Here's the fourth day, here's the fifth day vertically, and here's the distance in light, light years, and there is the beginning of the fourth day, uh, and I have the waters just stopping. They may have continued expanding, uh, but uh, let's just say they stopped at that point, out at more than 10 billion light years away from us. So here we, down here we have the Earth, and then <clears throat> I'm going to uh, give you a little graph uh, of what I think happened uh, to the light from those stars. I'm going to show you the light zooming in from way out there. And so it's going to be fast, diagonal. And let's just run the action here. Did you see that? I'm going to back it up and run it again. Okay, uh, now, you notice this red line across the top. He would have to slow down the speed of light from very fast, way out there. Uh, you would have to slow the speed down to today's speed and also the speed on Earth, as I'll emphasize in just a moment. Uh, I think the speed of light on Earth was normal, at the normal speed, and... I'll get to the reason for saying that. So the light was fast, but then this red line here uh, is a light slowdown, an instantaneous slowdown of all light all across the universe. And that's totally miraculous too. The uh, very fast light, trillions of times faster than today's speed, that's a, you know, that's a total miracle to go from, from that to today's speed, you know, 
God did something to the fabric of space or the rakia, the, you know, the way in which the waves of light travel. He did something sudden and instantaneous and powerful to make that slow down. So then I'm going to show uh, how the light traveled slower. It slowed to normal, so it would take more time to get uh, to the Earth. So wherever a light beam was coming in toward Earth, it, it's zooming in very fast, and then suddenly, boom, sometime near the end of the fourth day, uh, it slows down and travels slow like it does today. Yeah. The speed of light is slow. It, <laughs> that's our whole problem is it's just too slow. <laughs> so, uh, so that's a miracle, and I don't know how God control the speed of light like that to make it either fast or slow. But there's, unless he uh, completely suspended most of physics, uh, that would mean that uh, out there where the light was fast before it slowed down, uh, that time was very fast. That's a direct consequence of experimental physics that we know about. The speed of light controls the speed of time. You have fast light, you have fast clocks and fast time. Uh, so that's experiment, that's not theory. So, uh, so I'm thinking all he did was change the number in his basic equations, <laughs> or maybe he changed something on the dial of the control panel of the universe and moved the dial from way over here to close to zero. <laughs> And uh, so I don't know how he did it. Uh, so now the point is that if light is very fast out here, uh, it can't be fast on Earth also. We have to have ordinary time, uh, time at its ordinary speed, because uh, of verses like Exodus 20:11, For in six days God made the heavens and the earth, and the context is ordinary days of the week. Both the verse before that and the verse after that, ordinary days, in the same word, whereas he could have used uh, eons or other things. So uh, he's telling us that the days of creation were the same kind of days, same duration uh, as our days now. So. If if we have ordinary length days of the week, then the speed of light on Earth has to be what it is today, not fast like it is out in the heavens. You with me so far? Okay. So, now if time was fast out there, another consequence is that billions of years worth of events would have happened. Billions of years worth of events. So, uh, so things would be happening very fast out there. Uh, and the light that was emitted by the stars would be very, very blue. It wouldn't be at the normal wavelength we now see. But with this light slowdown, uh, that blue light would be as, you know, would be suddenly transformed to ordinary light. And uh, there wouldn't be any uh, shift in the wavelength except for the fact that those uh, stars and the rakia were had been expanding while all this traveling is going on so the expansion would make a, a small red shift but the enormous blue shift would disappear and it would be like if we look at out into space today we look out 6,000 light years to a window beyond which things, the light was traveling very fast. We're looking back into time, 6,000 years, and suddenly we come to this window, and that window would be entirely transparent to us. So uh, the light and uh, everything else, the events that we see would be appearing to have, would appear to be happening at their normal rate. Now, that may be a little hard to understand. I'll be happy to spend more time with you on that afterwards. 
But the bottom line is that uh, uh, by changing the speed of light like that, he gets a lot of history accomplished out there in the cosmos. So now, here time would be normal because we see the speed of light normal uh, out at uh, every indication that is that the speed of light is normal uh, nearby in nearby space. So we assume it's normal out there. But what we're seeing is actually light that started to us uh, during the fourth day and then slowed down suddenly. So we're looking, we're, you know, when we look at distant objects, we're looking at a window at about 6,000 light years away from us uh, through which the light beyond it, it came very fast to us. But the basic point is that those waters got out there in a real hurry. So uh, the point is that starlight would get here fast. And here's that verse uh, that uh, Danny was talking about in his last seminar. And let them be look for lights in the expanse in, of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Genesis 1.15. So he got the light here in a real hurry. The only way to have the stars do their function of giving light on the earth and have that be complete by uh, the sixth day when he said everything was very good is, uh, is to get that light here in a hurry. Now the advantage uh, to having billions of years worth of events out there in the heavens is that uh, things that look like they have taken billions of years to happen uh, would have had the time, that speeded up time to do it. He showed you, uh, if you were at his, his seminar last time, uh, the antennae galaxies, the two colliding galaxies that look like they have taken millions of years to collide. And yet, uh, you know, so either God had to create them in this rather peculiar form for some reason, giving the appearance of having taken millions of years, or else that collision actually happened. And so uh, having the billions of years available to us uh, is, is very good. Now, why would God want the billions of years? Well, uh, we've learned a lot from reading the heavens and seeing what has happened to them. And uh, on objects that big, it takes millions and billions of years uh, for those things to develop. So we're catching them at a stage somewhere near the last day, of, uh, the last part of the fourth day. We're, we're catching them after they have experienced uh, billions of years of their own time. So, uh, and I think he just wanted these events to be happening so we could unravel his physical laws, for example, and, uh, and learn more about it. Now, uh, so why did he want to get the light here fast? He wanted us to see his glory and his handiwork. That's, you know, the heavens de declare, you all know the verse, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse or the firmament shows forth his handiwork. So that's Psalm 19.1. 1. 